Friend of the show, Matt Leinert, stopping by to break down today's college football playoff. Speaking of playoffs, Chiefs are going to make it. So are the Bengals. But now Joe Burrow is being compared to Tom Brady. Woo! Is it going to be back-to-back losses for the Chiefs, courtesy of Tom Brady, either real or otherwise? And finally, the Mayo Bowl. I mean, you know what? There is a thin line between organic and gimmick, and cheese it walks it. Duke's Mayo does not. I'm sorry, that's not a tease for the show. That is just a take right off the top. Jenna Wolf is out today. I'm Kevin Wilds. That's Chris Broussard. That is Nick Wright, who, and I, I wrote yeah. this down. This is what he said before we started the show. I'm going to do the dumbest thing I've ever done on television in today's show. Yeah. Any other yeah. teaser you want to give That's us? That's saying there? a lot. Uh, it's coming up in about 68 minutes, maybe 70 minutes from now. It will happen. So letting 70. you know, America. Let's push to 70. We're going to push to okay. 70. Hey, it took 10 years, but Russell Wilson has finally suffered a losing season in Seattle, although Broussard is still holding out some chance. And though his future with the Seahawks <laughs> is up, is it up in the air, Mr. Unlimited is optimistic this won't be his last game. Kind of. Take a listen. I hope it's not my last game, but, you know, at the same time, I know it won't be my last game in the NFL. You know, so I, I'm just focused on the day, you know, and getting better today. And so that's that's my focus. That's my goal. I love the city and I love this, you know, this moment. So, uh, you know, I love these guys. And so we, we got to make sure we get better today. That's the only that's the only thing that matters. I mean, I guess so. Nick, what was your reaction to these comments? They're kind of ridiculous comments. And here's why. It's not only because he wasn't asked at all about his future in Seattle. This was, if you watch the whole press conference, it's not like, hey, Russ, this your last game. He's answering a totally different question and then does like a callback to something that was asked about Bobby Wagner. He's like, by the way, I hope it's not my last <laughs> game in Seattle. But the reason I say they're ridiculous wilds, if, if your neighbor is throwing a block party th- tonight, yep. a little New Year's Eve celebration, and he sees you out after the show... He's like, hey, you're coming to the party, right? And you're like, I hope to be there. It's like, well, are, you hope to be there. You're invited. You live next door. And it's like, no, no, no I, ho- I hope I'll make it. Yeah. The, the hope is under contract to a be there. ludicrous thing to say because you're totally, it's totally dependent on what you want. So here's what I mean, Broussard. Russell Wilson has a no trade clause. The Seahawks don't want to trade him. The only reason we have ever discussed Russell Wilson being traded is because his agent came up with a list. He talked to Dan Patrick. He started this fire. And it's like, oh, it's awful smoky in here. Someone should deal with it. And now he has repeatedly said a couple weeks ago, uh, Ian Rappaport was like, hey, here are three teams Russell Wilson wave is no trade clause for. He said, no, that's, that's, that's not accurate. I, uh, that r- report is erroneous. Now he's saying he hopes to be there. So unless Russell Wilson Broussard is a total phony, which I think is a possibility, then this should be the end of it. He has a no trade clause. His team doesn't want to trade him. He just said he doesn't want to be traded. So that's the end of it. But do we actually think it's the end of it? Not entirely, which leans you to the maybe it's a little bit of a phony thing, which I've been trying to tell you, but you love Mr. Unlimited so much you won't (laughs) listen to it. But yeah, I mean, so I guess it's over. I guess Russell Wilson, Seahawk for life. He has a no trade. It's no problem. Look, I, I do realize that I'm the only guy on this show that likes Mr. Unlimited. All right. I, I'm actually the only one on the show that <laughs> can like stomach him. Mr. Unlimited. All right. So I, I don't know, Wild. You, you picked him to reach the Super Bowl somehow, but I don't think you like Mr. Unlimited. Uh, I got to admit this, though. I don't believe him when he says, I hope this is not my last game in Seattle. I I, I have to admit that, like you said, Nick, why did you even bring it up? We know the three teams are out there, what, the Giants, the Broncos, the Saints, the three teams you would wave your no-trade calls for. There were four teams out over the offseason. That came from his agent, all right? That had to come from his agent, right? Or it came from the Seahawks leaking it. Who got it from his agent? All right, so there are shenanigans going on behind the scenes. But, Nick, the thing is, a lot of people think Seattle may want to move Russ. Now, you know where I stand on that. If you got a franchise quarterback 
who's 33 years old, smack dab in the middle of his prime. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. You don't trade him. It, I think Russ does kind of want a fresh start. I think that's why he's being a little disingenuous when he says, I hope it's not my last game here. But I think that fresh start could be in Seattle. And I'm not, I don't hate on Pete Carroll. I think he's obviously been a great coach. But if it means choosing the coach or Russell Wilson, then I'm choosing a new coach and sticking with Russ and making things fresh in Seattle rather than sending him, him elsewhere to get a fresh start. So I, I think there's a chance Seattle may want to move Russ, uh, Nick, but I don't think they should be thinking that way at all. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you, Broussard. Do you think when Russ looks around, and he started his career with two very quick Super Bowl appearances and a Super Bowl win, that he sits back and says, man, am I a one-ring guy? That's it? Because he earned, when he went there, he's like, you know, we'll be back. That was ta- part of his like mental state to get him over the Malcolm Butler interception, that he thought that he was going to be back, and he hasn't. And if you look around the league, do you think that Russell Wilson says, hmm, Tom Brady, seems like he's having more fun and has a better shot at the Super Bowl than if he stayed. Matthew Stafford seems to have cut the line. Hey, he was loyal to Detroit, and now they're in a better position than me. Why am I stuck here when I know I could go with Sean Payton, go down there, battle Brady? I think that's a nice little checklist on me. If I could go to Seattle, excuse me, go to New Orleans, challenge Brady. Do you think that when he looks around the league and sees the other opportunities that quarterbacks have gotten by leaving, that that adds a little fuel to the leave Seattle fire? Without question. Look, just like I don't think Kevin Durant ever thinks about going to Golden State if LeBron had not gone to Miami, I think seeing Tom Brady go to Tampa Bay, have so much success, have so much fun, get so many new weapons, be in a new system – I think that definitely put that thought in Russell Wilson's mind. And I also think he could look at Aaron Rodgers and say, you talk about a one Super Bowl guy, at least Russ got to two. Rodgers has only been to one Super Bowl. It got stale with Mike McCarthy. Now, they made it fresh with a new coach, but they still haven't won anything. So I think he's looked at both of those guys, Wilds, and said, I I don't want to end up like Rodgers, and I'd love to end up like Brady. But, but I get it. So, real quick though, a couple things. One is, but Rodgers, despite not being to another Super Bowl, Rodgers has at least been close four times. Since winning that Super Bowl, Rodgers has been to the conference championship game four times. Russell Wilson went to back to back Super Bowls, has not been a game away from the Super Bowl to a conference championship game since then. That's seven seasons, if we include this one, where they don't even make the conference championship weekend. But Broussard, and I don't say this dismissively at all, it doesn't matter what the Seahawks want, even if they want to trade him, if, Ru- if what Russell Wilson is saying is honest. If Ru- Again, I- I'm not trying to be too hard on the guy, but unless he's just being a total phony, and the reason I say total phony is he was not asked about his future. He brought this up unprompted. If you, if you, it's one thing if you're put in a bad spot and you're, or you're like, oh my God, I have to lie here. I can't tell you the truth. It's another thing where you don't have to say anything and then you just add a lie. You're like, hey, by the way, I'm coming <laughs> over this weekend and you're actually going on a trip to Connecticut. It's like, wait, we, I didn't even ask you if you were coming to watch for New Year's. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to be there. It's like, I didn't even ask, and now you're not showing up. He was not asked any of this. He just said, I hope to be here. He has a no trade clause, so he's there. If he is not being totally disingenuous, then for the next, at least next season, he's there, Broussard. He said it. He didn't say, I hope to be here under the right circumstances. He said, I hope to be here. He has a no trade. They can't trade him. He was asked earlier, he, he has said he wants to win three more Super Bowls. He was asked, do you think you can win those three in Seattle? So I get it. Yeah. That's not a direct question, Nick, about your few, you know, being in Seattle, but it's in the neighborhood. It's in the neighborhood. It opened up the door for him to kind of start talking about the future. And I do think, Nick, if the Seahawks go to him and say, look, Russ, 
We want to start all over. You know, we we know our run is ended. We want to send you somewhere yeah. where you you have a better chance to win, and it's better for us. You know, I think he'll be open to that discussion. I do believe that. Okay. Wow. But I still and like I'll be there tonight. Early dark horse I'm coming over. MVP. I'll see you. No Tell your family. I'm excited to see him. New Year's celebration. I'm you and me, Wild. I'll be there. I will. I'll be there tonight. <laughs> Jameis Seahawks, early dark horse MVP. Uh, hey, I'm wary. It should be <laughs> hey, Chiefs <man>. be. <laughs> well, Mr. 525, Joe Burrow, we'll discuss next. Upset alert time. Broussard, kick us off. Who you got? Well, Wiles, as you know, last week, I just went above and beyond what the producers and the segment title call for in an alert. And I just flat out told America, yeah. Indianapolis is going to be Arizona. And it happened. All right. This week, I'm going back to what the producers want. An alert. Just an alert. And I actually hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope this doesn't happen. The Cleveland Browns. You guys know I'm from Cleveland. Um, I think they need to be on high alert when they go to Pittsburgh Monday night. We know, I, I'm surprised they're even favored. I, I gotta be honest about that. I guess it's because the team outside of the quarterback played great last week in, in Green Bay and they looked good the week before losing with the third string quarterback. So maybe that's it. But when I look at how Baker Mayfield played the last game, four interceptions, I wonder where his mind's going to be at. All right, he is under a lot of duress. He's on the top of the bud list again. Uh, and uh, going to the opposite side, Pittsburgh, Big Ben acknowledged, is probably his last regular season game, at least, at Heinz Field. I think he's going to be jacked up. I think their team, the players, they're going to want to send Ben out on a high note. And they're also playing for a playoff spot. They're still alive. So I think this is a high, high upset alert for the Browns in Pittsburgh, Nick. Can we stay on this for just a moment, Broussard? I want to ask you a question. Any concern for you, because this is a trendy pick right now, any concern for you about any after effects of the last time the Browns were in this stadium? They were kicking the Steelers' teeth in in the playoffs. Up 20, what was it, 28 nothing to start the game. Just a total disaster yeah. for, and any concern about the emotion for Big Ben as this is his last game at Heinz Field. That actually working against the Steelers? Because I do like your upset alert picks. I just want to, mm. any concern on either of those fronts? No, I think Tomlin will use that. I mean, you're right. A reminder, hey, when this team was here last year, we, we remember what happened, all right, in the playoffs. They embarrassed us, ruined what was looking like it might be a good season for us. And so I think he can actually use that to a positive. You're right, Ben. Ben may be emotional, but I think the other team players around him will be helped by the situation, even if it brings him down a little bit at in early. I think he'll respond as the game goes on, if he's bothered by it early. All right, I'm going with another AFC game that has massive playoff implications. The red-hot Miami Dolphins upsetting the Tennessee Titans. Now, America, wow. when you're making these picks, there's a couple things you always want to check. You want to check the weather, and you want to check the injury report. Something very interesting happened on that injury report this week for Tennessee. A.J. Brown who that offense, you know, fell apart not only when Derrick Henry went out, but when A.J. Brown missed games. Then A.J. Brown came back. That offense, you know, perked back up, particularly in that game against San Francisco. A.J. Brown, not on the injury report Wednesday, and then all of a sudden does not practice on Thursday. A little lower leg injury to be concerned about. Now, they say he's going to play, mm. but if he's limited, the Titans are not able to move the football at all. What has Miami shown us? Miami is great against bad quarterbacks. This winning streak, the names of the quarterbacks they've played, aside from Lamar, here's who they've beaten in the winning streak. Tyrod Taylor, Joe Flacco, remember that game? Cam Newton, Mike Glennon, Zach Wilson, Ian Book. Now, luckily for Miami, the rest of the year, the two quarterbacks they play are also bad quarterbacks. Ryan Tannehill and Mac you. Jones. I believe 
The Dolphins continue the winning streak. I believe the Dolphins do me a solid because by beating the Titans, they essentially lock up the one seed for Kansas City, fulfill one of my many accurate prophecies about this Chiefs season, and set up a huge Week 18 showdown. Dolphins, Patriots, maybe with the final AFC playoff spot on the line. So Dolphins, not just an alert, an outright upset over the Titans to set up a huge Week 18 game against McCorkle and Bill Belichick. Okay, his name's not McCorkle, it's TBG to baby go. Okay, uh, Nick, starting off the new year, I'm going to need your support on this because I'm like, ugh, I'm on the fence. So I'm like, well, maybe Nick can help me out, be a good teammate. And I know you look for consistency from me because last week I picked the Lions to beat the Falcons and they came close. They came close. They did. This week, I'm going close. the other way. I'm going the it's not, it's not consistent, but you know what? We live in a chaotic world. Bills on upset alert against oh the Falcons. My. What? Wilds, are you just trying to jinx the Bills I'm because the steamrolled right the Patriots? I'm not. I am not. First of all, the game was sneaky close. Not close, but it was sneaky close. Here's the thing about the Bills. And Nick, this is why I need your support. What are, what do you call? Magic Mountain, Josh Allen. Up, and they're down. They're up, and then they're down. Right now, they are on and up, coming off of the Patriots' win. When's the last time they had a big win like that? Oh, against the Chiefs. What happened afterwards? Down against the Titans. What happened when they rolled, rolled the Jets and started feeling good about themselves? Ah, I know they're the Jets still, but we were just dominant. What happened then? Oh, meow. Lost to the Colts. Also, they're willing to overlook teams like they lost to Jacksonville. So I'm putting it's a it's a two touchdown spread here, Nick. I am putting the Bills yes. on upset alert, but I need a little bit of support. I'm about 98% of the way there. Well, you this is the only 2%. support you do it. I can I can give. This would be your most impressive upset alert pick. And you've had some great ones. You've nailed the Lions. You've had some that we laughed at you. And then not only was it an alert, it was an outright correct prediction. This to me would be the most shocking because even though the Falcons are still alive for the playoffs, you know, unlike, you know, the Seahawks or the Saints are alive, but barely, you know, my Falcons pick, which you all mocked me for, still alive. The advanced numbers tell you the Falcons are one of the worst seven and eight teams ever. They're, they've been outscored this year by 120 points. Whenever they play good teams, they only only lose. They lose by a ton. Here's what I... So, I want you to be right, and I know what you're wanting. This would open the door for the Patriots to win the AFC East again. You need the Bills to lose a game. So, I understand what's happening here. Here's my thing, Broussard, on Josh Allen, because I do call him Magic Mountain Allen. I think he's going to continue to fly high through the end of the regular season. And then that drop-off we're waiting for, it's going to be that first playoff game. I think there's going to be a lot of bills. Josh Allen, they got their mojo. Oh, they figured it out. Should Josh Allen have been gotten more MVP buzz? And then right down come the postseason. So I hope okay. you're right, Wilds, because I think it's good for the show that your upset alerts have been so good. I think this is this would be the most impressive one of the season so far. Because I don't think, Broussard, the Falcons can slow down the Bills I called. Bill I just Jackson. don't think they have the horses. I, I, think I this don't would be more hate impressive. your prediction about Josh Allen. I, I don't hate that, uh, Nick. I, I do think that could come to pass. Wilds, I'm sorry. You have been great all year. No chance. I am t- no, no chance, chance that Nick's Falcons beat Buffalo. No chance. Absolutely. That oh, Buffalo is going to win by at least two touchdowns. Mark my words. Respectfully, Broussard, I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you. I asked Nick because I knew that's where you're going to be. I didn't ask you. With all due respect, we got to end the year on a high note. Could Kyler and the Cardinals shock the Cowboys on Sunday? That's next on First Things First. Cowboys hosting the Cardinals. Two teams going in opposite directions. One's winning a bunch of games. One's losing a bunch of games. Nick, who is Sunday's game more important to, Cowboys or Cards? I'm going to say Dallas, and here's why. Da- mm. There's the very basic version of the Cowboys are still very alive for the one seed. If the Cowboys beat the Cardinals and beat the Eagles, 
They will be the one seed if Green Bay slips up one time. And Green Bay's got a tough game, I think, this weekend against the Vikings. So the Cowboys, the Cowboys are in good shape if they, and it's weird because you're like, but wait, the Cowboys lost to the Bucks. They did, but trust me, on the three-way tiebreaker, the Cowboys end up the one seed. If it's Green Bay, the Bucks, and the Packers, are, are all, I'm sorry, Green Bay, the Cowboys, and the Bucks all at 13 and four, which is possible if Green Bay loses to the Vikings this weekend. So there's, first of all, the Cowboys being alive for the one seed. The other reason is this, Broussard, and this is, I heard you, I, I, you know, react to my answer. So I thought you and I were going to agree here. So I'm interested to hear your answer. But the question with the Cowboys is, can they beat good teams? I know they're on this four game winning streak, but the four game winning streak has come against bad football teams. Two wins against Washington, a win against the Giants in there. And I understand they just annihilated Washington and they look outstanding. But this is, this absolutely could be a first weekend playoff game. This exact game. There, th- this is the exact type of team, if not the literal team, the Cowboys are going to have to beat in order to advance in the postseason. The Cardinals, on the other hand, Broussard, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what they are, which is a good but not a Super Bowl caliber team, and I'm not going to feel differently if they win or lose this game. So I, for me, the Cowboys, this determines whether they're in that cowherd Super Bowl bubble or not, right? If they lose this game, I think a lot of the shine comes off this four-game winning streak and that dominating win against Washington. Yeah, look, I was stunned by your answer because I, I don't even think it's close between who this game is more important for. But I, I get where you're going. You're basically saying the Cowboys have a chance to get to the Super Bowl and this they can get the yes. one seed if they win this game. You know, they got to do more. But winning yep. this game will keep them in the hunt for that. Arizona, no matter what they do, they're not getting to the Super Bowl. OK, I, I get that logic, but I'm looking I'm not looking at it like. As a macro picture like that, I'm thinking micro and I'm thinking psyche. You're right. I have beaten the drum yes. consistently about Dak Prescott and the Cowboys, but mainly Dak Prescott proving he can beat winning teams. We know he, his yep. record is that he struggled historically against teams with winning records. So this would be a great win for that. I, I get you there. But if Dallas loses this game, they can still look back and say, we won four straight. We bludgeoned a division rival uh, a week ago. It would be more of a wake-up call for the Cowboys versus a disaster. If Arizona loses, it's a disaster. And I get it. I don't think they can get to the Super Bowl either. But if they lose this game, Nick, it's a disaster. And it continues the narrative that they fizzle late in seasons. Cliff Kingsbury and now Kyler Murray, they fizzle down the stretch. And now, whereas this year, getting to the playoffs was the main thing, and you do that, even if you get beaten the first or second round, you get there, and now next year you're thinking Super Bowl. If they lose this game and go out meekly in the first game of the playoffs, now I don't know that they go into next season thinking Super Bowl. I think they go in thinking we're going to play well throughout the season. We're not going to fizzle down the stretch. And even if they start 7-0 and next year, in their mind will still be, what Who's will we do over it? the second half of the season? So I think they need this win. I think if they get it, they'll, you know, they can go in the playoffs with some confidence. If they lose it, Nick, that'll be four straight losses, six of nine. And even if they beat, I mean, a non-playoff Seahawks team at the end of the season, their last regular season game, that's not going to be enough Wilds to send them into the playoffs feeling good about themselves. No, I I 100% agree with you. I think belief for the Cardinals internally is the most important hurdle they need to get over. Look, if you lose to the Rams, ah, it's the Rams. They were always talking Super Bowl. Then they went to Detroit and lost to the Lions. And I think they were like, what's going on here? Then they lost to the Colts. If they lose to the Cowboys, Nick, I think that in the building, the Cardinals will just lose all faith, and then they go to Seattle, and guess what? Russell Wilson's like, you know what? For my for my swan song here, before I hightail it out to go hang out with either Joe Judge or Sean Payton, I'm gonna I'm gonna beat the Cardinals too. I think that we've seen the Cowboys talk about the Super Bowl from before the season started. 
Jerry Jones like, yeah, we can make the Super Bowl. Dak talked about Micah Parsons like, yeah, we can, we're trying to make it to the Super Bowl. If the Cardinals lose this game and they have a four-game losing streak going into Seattle, I think their season is shot, and your buddy Cliff Kingsbury has to be a little bit nervous. Well, so you guys both mentioned Kingsbury. Let me tell America the numbers on it because they're jarring. It, from Texas Tech and Arizona, his first he's coached nine years. His first over the first seven games of those seasons, he's 42, 20, and one. So that's a winning percentage of better than 67%. 42, 20, and one for the first seven games of a year. The rest of the seasons, he's 16 and 43. That is an impossibly Mm. bad trend over an entire decade. It is every year starts off great or even the years he started off okay and then ends terribly. Everybody at this point knows this about Kingsbury. I'm going to be proven correct on Kingsbury. It's just a matter of time. That to me, though, is less interesting and less concerning for the Cardinals than this part of it. The Kyler Murray question of, remember the narrative on Kyler, and it wasn't a narrative, it was just measurements coming into the NFL wilds. He's going to be the shortest quarterback ever, or since Doug Flutie. The smallest guy ever to be a full-time starter in this league. And you guys weren't with me on the show yet, but that was the entirety of my concern and my analysis going into it. When I said was, I know how dominant this guy was in college. I know how great he was in high school. I know what the resume looks like. But whenever you are the littlest ever in anything, I'm going to bet against you. I'm just going to go with history. And I don't think it's coincidental that Kyler Murray, in all three of his NFL seasons, has worn down and gotten beaten down by the end of the year. And that, to me, Broussard is a huge concern, a much bigger concern than the Kingsbury thing. Because it's you can get a new coach. Kyler was your number one pick when he's been healthy. And early in years, he looks unbelievable. And I know we always say, well, you can't account for injury. But can you when you're the smallest guy ever to play this position? And you by, by game 13, 14, 15, the hits have seemed to pile up and you seem to be a different guy. That to me is massively concerning for the Cardinals long-term, as they're going to decide this offseason, and I imagine they'll give it to him, to give him the massive contract similar to what Josh Allen got last offseason. No, you're right. It absolutely is a concern. I do think they'll pay him. I think they have to pay him. But last year you had the shoulder injury, and he played through it, but clearly wasn't the same guy, and they go 2-7 and down the stretch. This year you got the ankle. He missed three games. Now he's back. And his height, Nick, hasn't been a problem with him like seeing over linemen or, you know, throwing the football because he gets out and moves. But if he begins to break down physically and he's no longer moving, right? He's no longer moving the way he has. Now he has to stay more in the pocket and be more of a quote unquote traditional passer. That's where the lack of size could come into play as well. So he's got the injuries. That's a huge concern. And then it could even affect his play if this continues. So I'm with you there. But like you said, they got to pay him. And Kyler needs to be smart. Go get paid. Get your money now. Okay? You let him to the playoffs. It'll be the first time in five or six years. Get your money now. Don't wait. Because if it goes badly, then they might hold out on you. Uh, Gather the family around the television. It's the last medals of the year. This one is special. Kevin Durant back out of protocols. Had 33, but the Nets lost. Joel Embiid waved goodbye. Like, where? Back to our apartments? Uh, Nick, who made the medal stand? Good for KD. Ties LeBron in most 30-point games of the season. He'll catch up to him one day. Bronze medal, James Harden. (laughs) 33, 14, and 10. For Broussard's beloved beard, James Harden, really playing well post from Christmas on. Got to give credit where it's due. The beard, is he having the best year ever for a player who is medically overweight? I'm not sure, but it's possible. Silver medal, Giannis. Yo, as well, look it up, America. Giannis, the best player in the league. 33, 12, 5, 2, and 2 in a win over Wild's beloved Magic. 
maybe the worst team in basketball. Sorry, Pistons. Giannis is a treat <laughs> to watch night in, night out. It's just a joy. Good job, Giannis. But the gold, Troel Embiid in full trolling yes. fashion. He's going to hit you with 33 points and then some great trash talk and waves at the end. I'm going to be honest. Joel Embiid's play, probably only worthy of a bronze, maybe a silver. But with the wave at Durant, the jawing, the laughing, the great. smiling, and the holiday spirit, it's just such a great total package. He gets the gold. There it is. What a medal stand right there, by the way. We've got three total MVP awards and Embiid, who might win one one day. Great medal stand to close out great. the year, Wilds. It's a, it's a great medal stand. Fantastic it's a nice job. Medal stand. Too bad we're it's taking nice. a turn to the guy who's going to beat the Chiefs. <laughs> Also being called the next Tom Brady. We'll discuss next. Joe Burrow, fresh off of a 525-yard game, is playing against Patrick Mahomes. Defensive coordinator Steve Spagnuolo said, hey, when I look at him, I see a young Tom Brady. Greg Jennings joins us now. Greg, what are your thoughts on Spagnuolo's uh, comparison of Burrow and the GOAT? Well, for one, I'm not a huge fan of comparisons, but we do it all the time, especially when a guy is as young as Joe Burrow. But when you hear someone like Steve Spagnolia says it, um, a, a coordinator that's been around as a head coach and won a couple Super Bowls, he's seen Drew Brees in person and uh, as an opponent, he's seen obviously Tom Brady as an opponent. Um, he's been he's with Patrick Mahomes right now uh, every single day. So you have to take what he says um, seriously. Uh, and, and, and I think when you watch Joe Burrow, uh, you can see some similarities, especially in the personality of where Tom Brady has been and just the mindset of how he approaches his opponent and approaches the games and some of the, the, the nuances of wordplay that he uses at times. Um, but for me, I, I didn't see Tom Brady doing all of this at this stage in his career. Um, when I look at Tom Brady, he was more reliant on his defense than anything. They, they more so protected Tom Brady for a few years. Joe Burrow count, has come into the National Football League, and it's been all on his shoulders, um, basically putting the team on his back uh, in Cincinnati. But when you're, when you're about to play an opponent, you're going to give them all the praise that you possibly can this is an important game let's get down to the nitty-gritty here this is an important game chris yeah. and when you when you're playing a guy who has just struck for 500 yards on a ball decimated baltimore ravens defense you you, you got to give them some type of acknowledgement you don't want to say anything that kind of ticks them off a little bit and sets that fire ablaze all over again so you you applaud him for what he's done you give him a little stroke on the back and you allow your defense in those defensive meetings to know that I don't care about this guy. We're going to we're going to destroy this guy. That's what he's saying to his defense, but in, in front of us, yes, <laughs> praise the guy and say all you need to say. Well, they, I, I agree with the, the end of your statement, Greg, that I, I think he's playing Jedi mind games. And now, look, I do think he has great respect for Joe Burrow's ability, his talent. I mean, look, he's having a great season. It looks like he's going to have a great future. So I'm with you there. But I do think he is trying to get in Joe Burrow's head. We saw Wink Martindale went the opposite way. I mean, he didn't really bash That's him, right. but he just said, let's not fit him for the gold jacket yet. And you saw how that worked right. out for the Ravens. <laughs> so I, because it's rare. I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but it's rare that a coach will compare his own player to a Tom Brady, right? You don't want to put that pressure typically on your own quarterback and say, yeah, he's a lot like Tom Brady. You just don't do that. But you'll put it on the other guy because you want him feeling good about himself, coming in a little cocky, thinking, hey, they, they, I'm all that. And so I think he's trying to play mind games with Joe Burrow and maybe even, Nick, send a little message, a little jab, a fun jab to Patrick Mahomes to get him more motivated, hey, we got this guy coming in. Everybody's talking about how good he is. He's one of the young guns trying to yeah. take my throne in the AFC. Coach compared him to Tom Brady. I'm going to show you who's the one that's taking Tom Brady's throne. Yeah. 
who's the heir apparent. So I think there's mind games on two fronts that Spagnuolo is playing. Yeah, I think your callback to Wink Martindale is important. The previous week, Steve Coordinator's like, let's not fit him for a gold jacket. Burrow throws for 500. They keep throwing late in the game. He mentions how it bothered him. And now this week, Steve Coordinator Steve Spagnola says, hey, maybe he's Tom Brady. On the Brady comparison, I do think it should be taken seriously in this regard. First of all, thank goodness, it, it, you know, in honor of Brady, finally, an actual good quarterback is being compared to Brady as opposed to what's been happening oh, all year you. long with the kid in New England. Oh, the baby goat. Oh, look at him. Look oh, at these kid, comparisons. Oh, he's so much like Brady. Kid. Nothing wow. like Brady at all except for the fact they both played for the Patriots. Burrow actually stylistically reminds me of Brady a little bit in this regard. He's, his biggest strength is his accuracy, and his biggest weakness to which there is one is overall arm strength. That is also the case with Brady. And that's not a knock on Brady. You just, even if you have a strong arm, it can be your biggest weakness if your other parts of your game are so excellent, as is the case with Brady. And that's also been the case with Burrow is Burrow, and I understand he leads the league in, you know, touchdown passes of like 40 plus or 50 plus yards. But as far as his ability to fire it in to tight windows, it's probably his biggest weakness as if there is a weakness for Brady that had been similar with him. With all that said, and I think the Bengals are good. I think Joe Burrow's really good. It is unbelievable to me, Wilds, how the media insists on on a nearly weekly basis just saying things that they've got to know I won't totally age agree. well. I knew you're gonna get like this idea I knew you're go that there. it is just it is just the flavor of the week every week. And I had to, I've, I had to watch people I respect on the other network. Over this week, say Joe Burrow is a top five quarterback in football. Top five in football already. Yeah. I, I saw a buddy of mine, a guy I really liked yesterday, said he would rather have Burrow than Mahomes over the next five years. Let's all take a deep breath. Like, is Joe Burrow a Woody. top five quarterback in the AFC? Maybe. I, I think so. But you've got Mahomes. You have Herbert. I know a lot of folks love Josh Allen. And are we just going to act like Lamar Jackson is terrible now? Or is he just having a bad season? That's four names. The four guys who I would argue have all done more up to this point in the, the league than Burrow. Now, I like Burrow a lot. But let's all, let can we just take a bit of a breath for before no. we anoint Joe Burrow as the next mm -mm. all-timer? All like, and I think he's good. I think no. he's good, and I think the connection with Chase is excellent, and I think that they could score some points on Kansas City. But we, we can't do this every week, <laughs> where every week it's the yeah. new top yeah, five we quarterbacks. Can. We well, just can't. I would... I would not. I would like to do it every day or even multiple times a day. Tune into me and Broussard's uh, <laughs> podcast that we have coming out. Uh, we can discuss this at, at length. <laughs> so here's the thing. In like hip hop, we always like to talk about top five, top five dead or alive is always Jadakiss' thing. And there's a certain, or like, five guys that everyone sort of picks from. It's Tupac, MJ, usually, or Biggie, or it's kind of, like, in there. And then the other person's always the wild card. You don't know who you're going to pick. And then Broussard, remember, like, um, Black Thought had that long freestyle. It's like, top five, Black Thought is top five. And then after, after Jada did the verse, like, Jada Kiss, top five, put him in. This is <laughs> Joe Burrow's top five game. Maybe you can get him into four. You know you've got... The GOAT, Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers, that four spot is open. If he comes in and has a monster game against this vaunted, vaunted Kansas City defense, after a game where he throws for 525, Lamar is literally limping around the field. You don't get to be, you know, in it because you won an MVP. It's, we're, it's a very now topic. Are you willing, would you be willing to say that Joe Burrow could skyrocket up your rankings if he has a huge game? Yes. Yes, I, I think the, the three you mentioned, Rodgers, Brady, and Mahomes, those are solidified. Th that fourth one is in flux. And, yeah, Lamar, let's, I want to give him some respect, right? He's a unanimous MVP. He's having a down year. He's injured, all that. But right now, Joe Burrow's certainly playing better than him. And, I, Nick, I think it's Justin Herbert. Like, everybody's put Herbert ahead of Burrow. And I understand why. But Burrow, the numbers are very close. And what I love about Burrow, Greg, is his swagger and his attitude. 
Like, remember everybody was saying, oh, you shouldn't go to Cincinnati. Why don't you hold out? Why don't you do an Eli Manning and all that and go elsewhere? He was like, no, I, I, look, I can go there and make this team win. And he's done it. He has changed the culture. I know others, you can give Zach Taylor some credit and all that. But he has changed that culture and turned this team, if not a playoff team this year, which I think they will be, then certainly going forward, if they stay healthy, they're going to be a playoff team. So I think Burrow not only has the physical attributes, Greg, but I think mentally and leadership wise and, you know, all of that, I think he has the intangibles that are necessary to be a great quarterback, too. So I tend to agree with Wilds. So in that, for me, the, the back end of that, the intangibles of the mentality, uh, his, his leaderships, all those things, that's what tips the scale for me in nodding when what Steve Spagnoli is saying. Yes, all of what you guys have said when it comes to the physical attributes, but we've seen guys physically that we can compare to others. But very rarely do we see the mental side of things, which is a huge part of the game, in particularly at that position. And when he from the moment of him being questioned about being the number one overall pick and going to Cincinnati, all the all the questions that loomed over him of why would you go to Cincinnati? Are you going to are you going to not try to go to Cincinnati? Do you even want to be all of that? He he literally walked into all that and embraced it. He walked into that locker room and won it immediately with what he said, how he approached those guys. Mentally, when you think about his approach, his leadership styles, those are the things that that stand out to me in comparison to Tom Brady. Everywhere we've seen Tom Brady, New England and now Tampa Bay, anywhere he goes, Guys love him across the league. Guys want to be around him. They want to play for him. They want to play with him because he makes it about the team. That is Joe Burrow. Forget his physical attributes, Nick. Mentally and his leadership skills are what sells me on Joe Burrow. And I, I, I'm not going to hesitate. He's a top five quarterback in the AFC. No, listen, oh, yeah. I like I, – well, I agree with you, by the way. There's top five in the AFC. Top five in the league as a whole, to me, there's – I think Wilds is right. Mahomes, Rodgers, and Brady are the unanimous top three. And then Dak Prescott is like, hey, what about me? Kyler Murray, pre-injury, what about me? Josh Allen, some, Lamar, pre There's a Russell lot – Russell Wilson. Burrow, a lot of guys – Who's, yeah, Russell Wilson pre this year. Right. There's a lot of guys who make that case for it. The other the, – the, the other element here, because I think what Greg said is almost assuredly correct, but Wilds, the, the other possibility here is that what Steve Spagnuolo is saying is that Joe Burrow also is going to have his worst game of the year with a championship and undefeated season on the line, and we're going to embarrass him and ruin the... Oh, no. I mean, that is what he did to a young Tom Brady. The, you know, 07, 07 Super Bowl. Take. I know you pretended it didn't happen. That Maybe that's what he was saying. Maybe he's like, hey, we're going to pressure him up the middle. We're going to get him. They're going to stay in the teens, and we're going to walk away. Maybe that's what Spagnuolo's talking about. I'm not sure, but that is what he did to a young Tom Brady. So, for what it's worth. Hurt my feelings. Hey, time for Nick's picks. This guy went 3-0. He is back on track in a major way. Looking for a repeat week. Oh, oh, I can't even see you. I can't see you through all this money. Oh, I can't. Oh, my God. Look at all the money. Oh, yeah, that's right, America. What's this, a diamond ring? Oh, it is a diamond ring. Oh, my God, a new pinky ring, too. All right, oh, the, look at these diamond chains. That's what a 3 0 weekend to America. That's why you stay through. That's why you stay through the bad times. The 0 and 3 week. The disastrous bad beats for not only a 3 0 week, Wilds, but a week where there's no sweats. Oh, the culture underdogs? How about they went outright? Doesn't matter they don't have all their players. We don't need the players. The Bengals, three point favorites? Oh, how about they just win by 20? The Bills are underdogs? How about they lead wire to wire? That's what we do at the end of the season, America. Give me the picks this week. It's an underdog week, America, we because once upon a time I was go. an underdog. Now I'm dripping in <laughs> diamonds and dollars. Cowboys, six-point home favorites. Guess what? We're going to gobble up those points with the Cardinals. Cardinals plus six. Last stand for Kyler and Cliff Kingsbury. Give me the Cardinals plus six. Another underdog if we could. The red hot. Almost as hot as my picks. Miami Dolphins. Dolphins getting three and a half against another bad quarterback. What if the Dolphins showed us they beat bad quarterbacks? 
Give me the Dolphins plus three and a half. And our lock of the week, the red hot locks of the week. Can't remember last time I lost one. Raiders catching seven against maybe Carson Wentz, maybe Sam Ellinger. Doesn't matter. Raiders plus seven. We're going pick. three underdogs, all underdogs, right. all could win outright. And we are going to be soaring, soaring heading into the playoffs. Wow. I might not be on the show after this week because I might not need the money anymore. We'll see. There it is. Your three <laughs> picks of the week. Lock it in, America. Wow. I like that. You look like an old job, John Wilson. Travolta. My goodness. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> We're sorry. Do you think it's funny that uh, Chiefs Bengals wasn't the lock of the week? Why? We'll discuss next. Uh, not so confident? Back with Matt Leinert. Talking college football. Matt, I'm going to be honest with you. I am excited about these games. I am nervous about these games. Here's why. I'm excited for, like, the March Madness feel of it. The anything-can-happen vibe between Cincinnati and Alabama. Like, ooh, it's just like March Madness. It's just like when Sacred Heart has to play Kentucky. But here's the big difference. If Kentucky beats Sacred Heart by 50 points in March Madness, no one leans back and says, you know what? We should have never invited Sacred Heart to begin with. I told you. I told you they weren't any good. They play in too small of a conference. We just accept that's part of college basketball. If Cincinnati gets beaten soundly, do you think that will have ramifications for years down the line for for smaller schools that have undefeated seasons? Um, well, look, I, I, the average margin of victory in these college football playoffs over the years has been about 21 points in the semifinals. So right. it, it's safe to say we might see one blowout of the two games. But I don't think it does because one word, expansion. College football is going to expand here in the next year or two. We're going to probably go to 12 teams, which everybody seems to want. Uh, and in that format, you're going to get a group of five team. And you might even get two non-power five teams um, that that kind of sneak into the college football playoff. I look, it, it's unfortunate because that's what the narrative is going to be uh, around this game, and it already is building up to it. And then I've actually read where Alabama players feel like they're the underdog. I, I don't buy into any of that. Um, Cincinnati is different, in my opinion. The way I look at them is because they've built somewhat of an equity. Um, over the last couple of years, they're five and one against ranked opponents over the last couple of years. They have a big road win against Notre Dame this year. Notre Dame's a good football team. Um, we know uh, how they played against Georgia in the bowl game last year. And I know the argument against that is, well, Georgia sat players and people don't get up for that game. JT Daniels was balling at that time and, and they barely beat a really good uh, Georgia or they barely lost to a really good Georgia team. That was one of the hottest teams in the country a year ago. So, uh, look, I. I don't think Cincinnati is going to win this game. I know the spread is 13, 13 and a half, something like that. But this, uh, they're a really good football team. I, I think they earn their right to get into the final four. Um, they got some really good players on that team. And it, it's an experienced team. Um, and it's a team that is not going to look on the other sideline and be scared. They're not going to be nervous. They're playing Alabama. Um, but 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 it, it is it is a valid argument. It's a valid question, and and unfortunately, the perception around the group of five is well, you don't play anybody all season long. Now you're going up against Alabama. You're going to lose by thirty, and everyone's going to be like, eh, "I told you so." Um, expansion is going to help that because it's going to give those teams opportunities every single year to get into the college football playoff. <clears throat> And, and it's unfortunate because I do th- agree with the premise of Wild's question, Matt. That is what the narrative would be. And without expansion, I do think we would hear, even if the committee didn't specifically say it, we would hear people make the, anti, the anti-group of five argument based off of the, a result such as the one Wild's laid out. Even though, you know, Boise beating Oklahoma years ago or right. Utah right. success against Power 5 teams or UCF, right. th- right. those, the, it, the argument never went the other way. It was never, well, look. Look yeah. at what these teams have done. It's always qualified. Ah, the bit, the big school didn't care. They weren't into it. A- Alabama's going to be into it today. They're playing for a chance to play for the national championship. What has to happen, Matt, for this to be a game that's in question into the fourth quarter? For it not to well, be a uh, blowout. For it's a game where right, we're right. watching and we're like, oh, Cincinnati might win. What needs to happen in the you know quarters leading up to that? Well, well first, I, I want to say, though, Nick, is, is Bama – like Bama's a really good football team. There, there's no doubt. And, and I, we could talk about Bama. We, we know what they are. 
but they played their best football against Georgia in the SEC championship game, and that's fine. But if you look at their whole body of work, this wasn't a dominant Nick Saban football team. And it no. doesn't matter. They got to this point during the playoff. But I, I don't look at Alabama. I'm saying this is a world beat. Not like I looked at LSU a couple of years ago with Joe Burrow, and not like I looked at Alabama last year with all of those horses they had on offense. Bryce Young is a really good football player. Will Anderson is a really good football player. But this is a team that's been vulnerable at times all season long. So that's why I don't look at this game and be like, well, this is a, this is a big time mismatch. There's such a huge talent gap. Like I, there is, but Cincinnati's really good. So to answer your question, it, it, I, I'm fascinated, guys. And, and, and to watch this game, keep an eye on this is, is how do you slow down Bryce Young? No one has really been able to do it all season long. And he tore up maybe the best defense in the country a couple weeks ago in the SEC title game. You can't blitz him because he gets the ball out too fast and he knows exactly where he's going with the football. If you sit back, he will pick you apart. And then he has the ability just to make plays, to move around and make plays when things break down. He has the whole package. But Cincinnati's strength is the secondary. They got two bad dudes on islands on that side of the football with Kobe Bryant, who's going to wear – the late great, one of my, my favorite athletes of all time, Kobe Bryant's number in this game, um, Sauce Gardner, two oh, yeah. first-team All-American quarter, or cornerbacks that can kind of play on an island and say, you know what, listen, we're going to go and shut down your guys as best as we can. We're going to stack the box. We're going to blitz. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to have answers for Bryce Young, and we're going to make them have to win those one-on-one -on -one games and say, listen, your players, Jameson Williams, your guys are better than ours or our guys are better than yours. And that's the only way you can do it if you're Cincinnati because – Cincinnati can't sit back and just let Alabama run the football pound for pound because their D line will just get their D line is, is going to be out physical in this game. So that's one thing to kind of keep an eye on in this game is they have the defensive components to potentially slow down the big play capability of Alabama. Um, and we've seen, we've seen teams this year shut down Alabama offensively at times. And then offensively, if you go back to, um, Alabama's kind of kryptonite. The, the two times they've lost in the playoff, right, they lost to mobile quarterbacks. They lost to Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson, uh, and they lost to teams that had great defenses. Desmond Ritter is that. I mean, this is going to be a big-time test for him. He can move around. He can make plays. He's a really good player with a lot of experience, and I just talked about that really, really good defense. So I, I think it's, it's a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really fascinating matchup. Um, Luke Fickle is a, one of the best coaches in America. He'll have those boys ready. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sitting up here picking Cincinnati to win this game, but I, I think it'll be closer than people think. I really do. All right, Matt, Georgia, Michigan, who do you have in that? How do you see this one playing out? Listen, I, I, the line on this one is, is interesting to me. I, I have Michigan winning this game outright and I'm not a big 10 homer. I trust me. I, I I've seen Michigan play multiple times this year and that is one of the best teams in all of college football and Alabama just gave Georgia or excuse me Alabama just gave Michigan the recipe you slow down that offense you get after Stetson Bennett you make them have to play from behind um, and that's that's a way you can beat Georgia and you look at Michigan with Hutchinson who's a who's a beast a Jabba who's a beast Mike McDonald the defensive coordinator who came from the Baltimore Ravens might be the best coaching hire of all of college football last year he has injected just an energy and passion in that side of the football and has those guys playing at a high level so they have the ingredients with that pass rush to slow down georgia and affect them and then offensively um it, it's the first time i think you guys would all agree it's the first time that under jim harbaugh michigan they've had an identity a consistent identity all yeah. season long i mean we know what they are they have the best offensive line in the country they run the hell out of the football and Josh Gaddis has done a great job of getting all of their playmakers, the, uh, all of their playmakers touches in games, whether it's their tight ends, whether it's their receivers, whether it's Haskins, Blake Corum, they've just done a really good job. And, and we were at that game against Ohio State and Ohio State isn't the same as they've been the last couple of years, but they physically dominated that team. This is a tough test, Georgia, that D-line, those players. But I'll tell you what, I, I think Michigan's going to win this game. I'm telling you, I think Michigan's going to win this football wow. game. Wow. Matt, I, I here, just baby. spent Hot an take. untold amount. <laughs> <laughs> I just spent an untold amount of money uh, or at the University of Michigan to send one of my daughters through there for four years. So I'm pulling for the Wolverines. <laughs> I love what you said about them. 
Uh, and look, I don't think Harbaugh was going to get fired. Um, obviously, he's got all his ties to Michigan, and he has put them back on the map in this year, taking it to another level. But I've seen his players talk about how much he's changed and how much he's adjusted this year. What did he do? I mean, they were two and four last yep. year. I know it was yep. a shortened season and strange, but what changes has Harbaugh made that, you know, led them to have such success this year? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and so I actually talked to a few people throughout the year that are close to the program, football guys who are in that building every single day. And the biggest change, there's a couple changes. I mentioned Mike McDonald, the defensive coordinator. He made some great hires. You know, he, he held on to Josh Gaddis, his offensive coordinator, who just won the Broyles Award for the top assistant, where he could have fired him a year ago. Um, I think the continuity of that offensively was huge. He got that D.C. and Mike McDonald, who was, I told you, one of the best hires in college football this year. So he got younger. He got more energetic on that side of the football. And then with talking to the guys around the program, he's honestly, for, for lack of a better word, he's just he's he become more likable. He became more likable, more, uh, you know, these coaches were able to come up to him and talk to him and bounce ideas off to him where as you know, I've been on I've been on teams where, where head coaches, it's kind of my way or the highway and I'm going to run it this way and. And then you see what happens. And that's kind of what Harbaugh was prior to this. It's just, you know, the, the, whether it's the ego or not, he was more willing to adapt to um, his assistants, w- more willing to listen. He, he did more interviews this year. He was, it, it's just, it just was a different Jim Harbaugh. I mean, we got him on the set after the Big Ten championship game. And, and you guys know how it is. Like, we're, we're like, all right, we might get Jim for, for a minute. He was on set with us singing the fight song with Charles Woodson. He, he just had a different personality this year. So I think he understood, you know, what was happening in Michigan, understood what he needed to do to change. So he did that from an X's and O's standpoint, and he did that from just a personality standpoint to be more acceptive and more, you know, just open to his staff and more likable and all those things. And I'll tell you what, he smiled a lot more. Um, he also had great leadership, but we talked about it all season long. The leadership on this team – with Hutchinson and McNamara and, and, and Haskins, like it, it, great leaders um, equal great teams, equal a lot of great wins on the field, great success. When you have great leadership, guys that have been in the fire, they have that as well. So here, I didn't send any of my kids to Michigan. And by the way, Broussard's lying. His daughter's brilliant. She assuredly was there on full scholarship. Probably cost Broussard maybe room and board at best. But aside from that, but the rest of it's true. But here's why I'm rooting for Michigan, Wilds. Because I think it is good for college football, for the players and the programs, but most for the players, For programs to be patient with their coaches, I think the constant turnover is bad for the players in general. Yep. And it it is, and this is to me, Wilds, a good reminder of how thin the margins are. It wasn't just two and four last year. It was blowing the game against Michigan State. And then if you were watching Michigan Penn State, it looked like, oh, they're done. They, they, they've blown a fourth quarter lead. Penn State's come roaring back. Michigan's going to lose again. They're going to end up, you know, they're going to be nine and three, something like that. They're going to get rolled by Ohio State and another disappointing year. And instead, they end up coming back in the fourth quarter against Penn State. They roll Maryland. They roll Ohio State. And they annihilate Iowa. They won their final two games against Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship yep. game, 84 to 30. And now we've got the great Matt Leinert saying they're going to beat Georgia. I just think it's good for programs to be patient and to recognize we're not all Alabama, we're not all Clemson, you know, prior to this year and to and to say, you know what? 10 and 2 is pretty good. And so I just even if it's not what we're going for. So I think this would be a good representation of cuz this wasn't a Michigan team that with 3 weeks left in the season anybody thought was going to be here. And so I, that's why I think it's good for the sport, Wilds, if Michigan wins. I did not have that on the board, Matt. Nick Wright being patient with head coaches. That was the surprise <laughs> Only of the coaches. Oh, it's true. One. It's not true. Okay. 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 Professor Matt, Lundell, get him out. It's forward. True. Get him if, out of here at the pro level. If Harbaugh can win, <laughs> where, where do you, what do you think that does to his legacy with all of college football? 
I mean, it puts them down as one of the, the best to do. I mean, there's only a, a handful of coaches that are coaching that have ever won a national championship. And, and Nick is absolutely right. I mean, so many teams have these unrealistic expectations every single year. Just because you're Michigan, Michigan hasn't won a national championship since 1997. I think they won one big title in the early 2000s. So, um, you know, prior to this year. So I, I think – I, just to that point, Nick, I mean, Scott Frost at Nebraska is a perfect example. Now, what are expectations at Nebraska? I think you win seven, eight, nine games. I'm telling you, Nebraska is a team. They held on to Scott Frost. I think that's going to pay dividends for them next year. But yeah. Jim Harbaugh, he kind of got the monkey off his back, guys. He not only won the big game, he won a Big Ten championship, and now he's in a college football playoff where I believe he has a legit shot to win a national championship. This isn't just a fluke. It wasn't like wow. it was maybe Michigan State a couple of years ago where you get in and you just know you're going you're gonna to lose. Michigan has a very, a very real shot of getting to a title game and winning it based on, based on their formula and based on how this team has played all season long. Matt, that yeah. was excellent. Thank you for joining Let's us. Go. Happy Let's New go. Let's go, Michigan. <laughs> go Wolverines. <laughs> Coming up after the break. Oh, there's a national champion, Joe Burrow, just like Mac Jones. Does he have a chance to upset the Chiefs? We'll discuss after the break. Stories to start your morning. Sponsored by Ram Trucks. You know that. Built to serve. Oh, guess who's coming in to Cincinnati? It's Patrick Mahomes. And the mighty Chiefs. And the mighty vaunted defense. Have you seen their stats on what they do in the second half? But have you seen what Joe Burrow did last week? Threw for 525 yards after the Ravens said, hey, slow down on the Hall of Fame jacket stuff. Joe Burrow said, I won't slow down. Steve Spagnuolo took a different approach. Said, you know what? I see a young Tom Brady. Nick, what was your take on Joe Burrow being compared to Tom Brady? Well, let me first address, you know, because Wilds, since he's in the host chair for the week with Jenna out, he takes a little journalistic liberties with facts and numbers and things like, oh, the vaunted Chiefs second half defense. Can we just show the the Chiefs ranks real quick? Because I got the Chiefs winning this football game. I think the Chiefs will win the game. I think they'll cover. That's the number one offense and the number two defense since week 10. You might say, why did you choose week 10? Oh, because that's from the moment after the throw heard around the world. The moment after Patrick Mahomes turned everything around with that third and ten throw against the Packers, Wilds laughed at me, scoffed at me, said I was embarrassing myself in the show, saying this moment changed the trajectory of the NFL season. Oh, since then, Wilds, it's just the number one offense in the entire NFL since that very moment. That's That's just the facts, my friend. Now to Joe Burrow. I do see there are some traits in Burrow that are similar to Brady in that he doesn't have the strongest arm, but he's absurdly accurate. He seems to be a tremendous motivator. His teammates love him. I I get that. So I'm not comparing him to Brady, but I do under stylistically, let me put it like this. Stylistically, he's a hell of a lot closer to Brady than Josh Allen is or Patrick Mahomes is. And I think that's what Steve Spagnuolo is getting at. I also think Broussard that Joe Burrow is the latest recipient of the overblown, way too early media hype award. And we've given it to like (laughs) seven guys this year. Kyler got it. Josh Allen briefly got it. Uh, There was a Justin Herbert had his time in the sun in a loss, actually, to the Chiefs. And now it's Joe Burrow. And it's I, I think Joe Burrow's really good. I don't think he's 525 yards passing good against a typical team. The Ravens secondary, not a typical team right now. And because he was mad about what Wink Martindale said, they kind of tried to, you know, gash him for some extra yards at the end. But I think that we have reached this thing with top five quarterbacks, Broussard, where there's nine guys people call top five quarterbacks. Now, it's a testament to Burrow that he's in that conversation among those nine But one of those guys is ninth. One of those top five quarterbacks, actually the ninth best quarterback, because you list nine names typically. And so I think Burrow is good. I don't think they're going to be able to beat the red hot best team in football Chiefs. But I think it'll be it's the game of the weekend. And I think it'll be high scoring on both sides. Look, you're right, Nick. I mean, look, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, those three are set as the top three. And before the season, I think Russell Wilson was probably set at four. 
But now sure. that's debatable. And then it's a bunch of guys battling for four or five and, and all that. Uh, and Burrow's in that discussion. And I do believe this Spagnola has tons of respect for Joe Burrow and his ability and all that he can do on the football field. But this was a mind game. He saw what happened. You mentioned Wink Martindale last week with Baltimore. And he kind of sarcastically before the game, oh, we're not fitting him for the gold jacket yet. You know, he's not a Hall of Famer yet. Can we calm down? Kind of like what you just said about, you know, everybody praising these young guys. And uh, Burrow went and punished him. 525 yards, four touchdowns, all right? I think Spagnoli was going the opposite way. Oh, he's Tom Brady. You know, this guy is off. Now, he loves his game, but you don't compare anybody to Tom Brady, all right? And I think also, Nick, this is a mind trick in another way, too, to just give Patrick Mahomes just a little bit extra motivation. You know, we know how great Mahomes is, and like you said, all that talk about him struggling early in the year, during this eight-game win streak, he's got what, I, I think it's 15 touchdowns and just four picks. So he has figured it out, oh, so and he's good. been great against the cover two, right? That was supposed to be his kryptonite. Oh, yeah. He's been great against that. So, But I think maybe Spagnolia, you know, if you have one of your coaches saying, oh, this guy we're playing next, he's Tom Brady. He's the next one, you know, we're comparing to the GOAT. I just think that your, your, your offensive quarterback is saying, okay, all right, I see you. I see you. I'm going to show you who really is the heir apparent to the GOAT. But I want to throw this at you, Nick, because you've been saying that the Chargers are the team in the AFC that scares you the most. We'll see if they even get in the playoffs. Yes. But the Chargers, I think, are similar to the Bengals in a lot of ways in that mainly they're both – they got great young quarterbacks and they're both – wildly inconsistent, right? Wildly. Yep. You don't know. I mean, yep. Cincinnati puts 41 on the Ravens and 41 on the Steelers and then gets beat by the Jets, you know, and then gives yep. up, what, 41 or something like that to the to the Browns. To the so I w- do oh, they, their ceiling, is, it's like sky's the limit when they're on their game. So, so why so don't here's or why. do they scare you yeah. as much as the Chargers? No. Two reasons. One is I'm not a, the biggest Zach Taylor fan, and I know on the, you know, I know Brandon Staley's a somewhat controversial figure on this show because he dares believe in math and numbers, and I know that sometimes you know we, we got a few Copernicuses or want to be Copernicuses on the show. Or that might be the actual wrong thing. Copernicus was right, not wrong. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I so I think the I, I think the Chargers have a coaching edge. I also think the Chargers have great defensive players. And the Bengals don't have the Bengals don't have a Derwin James and they don't have a Joey Bosa. And while the Chiefs played great in that fourth quarter against the Chargers in an overtime, it's not lost on me that went wild when Kelsey went wild was when Derwin James went out of the game. So I think that that that's yeah. why even though right now the Bengals are more likely to make the playoffs than the Chargers are, the Chargers to me still put have they cause a lot more trepidation than the Bengals do wild. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a question to you, Nick, a resident Chiefs fan. And Patrick Mahomes is mm-hmm. has a more pure heart than I do. I admit that. But if I was Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes, a little bit of me would be like, you know what? I hope Joe Burrow does put up some points so I can get back to slinging the ball around the field. I don't mm-hmm. have. To, I I know you guys are complimenting me, Patrick Mahomes, that I take what's given to me. Uh, I'm feeling a little restless, though. I would like to maybe be down two touchdowns so I can, oh, show how good I am again. woo Throw the ball. Are you at all, Nick? Do you think there is a little bit of you that you would like to see a high-scoring, high-flying game so Patrick Mahomes can oh. air it out? Yeah, listen, I, I agree that over the last, you know, what is it, six weeks, seven weeks, the Chiefs' offense hasn't been quite as explosive as I would like. I mean, explosive enough to lead the entire NFL in scoring, but not quite. It's not 40 a game. You know, we like 40 a game in Kansas City. 33 a game is one thing. 40 is really what we would like to see. Uh, But so here's the thing. I do think that this could be a high scoring game. I think the Bengals are going to be able to score some points. I do not think at any point the Chiefs are going to be trailing by two touchdowns. I think we're going to be here Monday morning. 
And the question is going to be, Chiefs, are they going to rest starters in week 18 with the one seed locked up, baby? Titans lose, Chiefs win. Like Let's go. One seed with a week to play. Good. <laughs> I agree. Happy New Year, everybody. I agree. Undisputed up next.